okay thanks so much um uh so i i i'm uh, talking today about um an inshore fishery model uh for the arctic um this is uh uh, work together with the uh, Joe Haven uh, Hunters Trappers uh, Association and the Talo York Hunters and Trappers uh, Organization, um, two um, organizations and small communities in Nunavut that uh, are interested in commercial fishing and that also uh, uh, depend a lot on fish for uh, food security and subsistence harvesting. Well, you can see some pictures here of our meetings and maps and discussions of uh, past and future commercial uh, harvesting. I've been working in Joe Haven since 2015 and in Talo York since 2020. And so it's uh, it's uh, really um, nice to work with uh, experienced uh, knowledge holder, holders and um, uh, fishers. <clears throat> there are lots of partners on this project too. And this, there's a lot of uh, major funding from uh, Genome Canada for a project called Fishes, Fostering Indigenous Small-Scale Fisheries for Health Economy and Food Security, and also by Polar Knowledge. <clears throat> and we have lots of partners also in other areas uh, that we are working in. So to give you a quick overview, um, I want to talk quick, uh, today briefly about Arctic fishery status and challenges, especially in Nunavut. Uh, fishery models in terms of governance, infrastructure, supply chain, branding and marketing, and local employment and profitability. And then I want to talk a little bit about data and biomonitoring for these fisheries and also some uh, improvement opportunities uh, that I see out of my own like uh, view of the research. And uh, hopefully we can have some discussion on that later on. So talking about the status and challenges, uh, in in the Arctic, uh, balancing food security with commercial or recreational interests is, of course, very uh, uh, important, uh, especially since uh, systems are very fragile. There's a lot of dependence on, of, uh, on subsistence harvesting. There is limited Western science data. Most of uh, the quotas that we have in, in the Arctic are based on some work that was done in uh, the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and so there's a lot of a uh, need to update those and to maybe have other uh, ways of governing um, commercial sites. And also, a large volume of those quotas that were determined in the 70s, 80s for Arctic char and whitefish are not being used. As you can imagine, climate change is felt two or three times more in the Arctic, and this affects safety while fishing on the ocean. And it's more difficult to time the run of fish and uh, ice conditions are more treacherous and uh, uh, less predictable. It's also more likely to get stuck on the land uh, with spoiling catch, especially in the summer, which is an issue and a riskiness for commercialization. There's a lack of infrastructure, uh, high shipping costs, and branding and marketing of unique characteristics of Arctic fish is missing. And, and there is some uh, effort and some progress being done, but lots more can be do, uh, done on that. It gives you an overview. This is just in metric tons. Uh, commercial quota uh, currently is about 790. Uh, the harvest is only 85 of that. Uh, and uh, subsistence harvest is about 532 metric tons as a rough estimate. Uh, so you can see here the importance of subsistence, of uh, also how little of the commercial quota actually currently is being harvested. I'm today like to look at five different models. Um, one is the uh, regional regional fish plants. In Nunavut, we have three of them, uh, of uh, one in um, Cambridge Bay, one in Rankin Inlet, and one in uh, Pangatang. They are different quite a bit in the way they, uh, what they uh, target. In Cambridge Bay, it's mostly a summer inshore fishery. In uh, Kivale, in, sorry, in Rankin Inlet, it's mostly a uh, winter inshore fishery with very limited actually processing of fish. Uh, and in uh, Pangnatang, it's a mix of offshore inshore fishery uh, where you have turbid and Arctic char targeted. But then we also have some other models that are um, occurring uh, recently. And this is direct sales of local harvesters to intermediaries through a program like Lake to Plate in Nunavut and also direct sales of local harvesters to predetermined buyers uh, in a more formal way 
some something that uh, some of you might be familiar with in BC was River Select uh, and River Select model. So I um, uh, tried to create a table of uh, comparing those different um, uh, models in terms of governance, infrastructure, supply chain, branding and marketing, local empl employment and profitability. And um, the first model that is uh, a regional fish plant with summer intra fishery, it's mostly controlled by the fish plant with local teams, uh, captains and different fishing locations float plants that bring those fish quickly to the plant and are being processed, but it's mostly controlled by the fish plant itself. Uh, and uh, it obviously needs large freezer space, large ice making capacities for a very concentrated uh, um, short term um, summer fishery. Um, the supply chain is a regional purchase of the fish directly from the local teams during runs. And then it's being sold uh, to um, uh, through, through certification with Ocean Vice, uh, Ocean Wise, um, through uh, two other markets in the south and in Nunavut. Uh, so it's seasonal harvesting, uh, year and year-round processing, uh, um, plant staff, good seasonal income for harvesters, and also uh, all year-round staff in the plant, which is an advantage. The profitability uh, th that fish plant usually relies on subsidies it has not, never broken even so it's very low there is a lack of economies of scale float paints are not cheap and high energy and shipping costs the other plant uh, in rankin inlet is a winter fishery uh, it buys from regional harvesters not from teams more individual harvesters as opportunities come up uh, it has, it's a regional processing and shipping facility with medium uh, freezer space. The supply chain is regional and cross-regional purchase of fish directly from uh, local teams when supplied. The fish plant labels, but uh, has less control over product consistency because it's a more of an ad hoc delivery. Uh, it's year round, depending on supply by harvesters, limited income for harvesters. Uh, they don't get paid a lot. And they, they are, because it's a winter fishery, you don't have the volumes of fish that they catch in a very short time. So overall, the profitability is very low, lack of, of economies of scale, high energy and shipping costs and excess capacity at times in that plant. Then we have um, in Pangnatang, for example, a uh, mixed offshore intro fishery. This fish pad buys from regional fishery cooperatives or vessels and individual harvesters for inshore. It's a regional processing and shipping facility, large freezer space, a large uh, ice making capacity. Um, and it sells to wholesalers and direct to businesses. The branding and marketing is by fish plant and vessel owners and investors. It's seasonal and year round, depending on quotas and use of plant capacity, good opportunities for high seasonal incomes for, for uh, local employees and uh, a lot of Inuit employees that can benefit from that. The profitability is low to moderate. Um, there again is lack of economies of scales, not big enough, high energy and shipping costs, but there's cross subsidization from the offshore catch that helps to some extent. All right, so and then uh, model four is kind of uh, a direct sale to intermediate intermediaries. Um, we saw this morning a presentation by Skipper Otto. That's uh, one of those companies that is buying this, uh, this fish directly from harvesters. It's a loose structure with some controls by local hunter-trapper organizations. The infrastructure is freezer space and perhaps limited processing capacity. Uh, and the branding is uh, local differentiation is possible by family, uh, by type of fish. It's much more individualized. Um, local employment is part time with higher returns for local harvesters. The profitability is low risk and uh, some cost with, uh, and low risk and low cost with some uh, logistical support costs. And then finally, direct sales to predetermined buyers. There's some form of governance structure overseeing quality control in the supply chain. It needs just freezer space, ice making, if for summer fishery, tubs and sleds. The supply chain is from harvesters organizations to buyers and auctions. And uh, 
for example, River Selects is, is using an authentic indigenous foods kind of supply chain label. Their certified handling procedure and quality management plan with local differentiation and labeling. And the employment is part to full-time employment of Harvested at potentially very lucrative returns, medium risk, and there is quality assurance, logistic costs with high returns if this quality and delivery is, delivery is consistent and can be met. So here's just an example uh, of uh, Ketikmiat Foods um, in Cambridge Bay. These are the financial statements. As you can see, the total revenues are slightly higher than total expenses, but that uh, factors in a subsidy of $360,000. If that wasn't happened, that is part of the revenues. If that wasn't there, they would make a loss. Um, the same is true. And they do catch 88,000 pounds of Arctic char in the summer fishery. So it's, it's, it's quite a lot of volume uh, that um, keeps the, the staff busy all year round, but um, again, at a, at a small loss. In, in uh, Rankin Inlet, you see here the same uh, kind of uh, story, $330,000 of subsidies that basically allows them to make uh, break even almost in 2020, not before in 2019. Uh, but they only catch 1,500 pounds of Arctic char. The rest is caribou and muskox, and that's actually what's making it more lucrative to uh, process there at the moment. Here you can see the number of jobs that uh, are created, um, and this is not insignificant uh, in uh, an economy in the north that doesn't have a lot of opportunities, and where renewable resource like fishery can actually create uh, some jobs that uh, are quite important. Uh, all right. I'm coming now to data and monitoring. Um, what we have in these fisheries is genetic data to differentiate these stocks and that could make it uh, interesting and lucrative for um, marketing. We do need biomass data updates, uh, in, in, uh, indigenous knowledge and community preferences on flesh color, taste, access and availability are very important to, to differentiate what is needed for food security and what, is, um, what could be used for um, commercialization. The safety of travel and cost per pound for different fishing locations is important to estimate because it differs quite a bit. And uh, we need biomonitoring technology options. We have several. Uh, we are working, for example, with an in-reach satellite tracking technology. And there's SICU, uh, Smart Ice, and also designated harvester surveys that are being used. Here, it gives you just an idea about um, safety on the land. Um, the, the, the delay rate as a percentage of all the trips in Joe Haven, Nunavut has substantially increased from 2017 to 2020, which is a concern. And uh, here we also estimate a trip cost component. As you can see here, um, the, the average capital and repair costs factored into harvesting are quite substantial, especially for boats, uh, but also uh, other trip cost components like gas and food that need to be considered uh, when uh, we uh, look at uh, uh, potential compensation for harvesters to bring in fish to plants or to any of the other models. You can see the median cost per pound, quite substantial by boat, um, although we probably will need more trips to get a better estimate about the actual cost uh, per pound and much lower for snowmobile and ATV, which favors a bit of a winter fishery. Just gonna check my chat, three minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the time signal. Um, I'm almost done here. I improvement opportunities. I think uh, we need more of a specific indigenous fair trade model and labeling with tracking of fish by community area and family. Branding of cultural differences in types of fish, their location, their flesh type, and stories behind them. Genetic distinctions could go along with labels and branding that we are collecting through our uh, projects. Uh, establishment of a limited quantity direct buyer market in Iqaluit, Yellowknife, Edmonton, Vancouver, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto. That alone, uh, there's so much demand. Uh, that this uh, fish does not have to leave Canada. And if those markets could be established, uh, 
we I think could uh, create a really good niche market uh, for for this product. And finally, what will it take to succeed here? First, of, of course, community interest and support. Hunter Trappers Association endorsement and involvement, very important because they are responsible for sustainability, for the use of food and fish in, in, uh, in the communities. Careful distinction between subsistence and commercial sites, local commercial fishery champions and interested harvesters that get involved, and local fishery facilitators and some governance structure, support in setting up supply chain and handling protocol by Hamlet and other levels of government, a combination of indigenous knowledge and Western science data for the most value added for the community and branding and marketing of this unique Arctic product and differentiations, ongoing local monitoring of fishery activities and volume sold, and finally, ongoing reassessment of fishery abundance and use and supply chain operation. So those are th 10 things that we came across that uh, are important to make to succeed in, in this business and uh, I've stopped there and I'm looking forward to some discussion and inputs. If we have time, I can take questions, but I don't see the questions. Oh, we have one question for you. At least. Sure. Yeah, Stefan, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Grant Murray. I just had a question about your um, your comments about branding and marketing. I was wondering yeah. to say a little bit more about that, like the specifics of what that branding and marketing might contain and, and also who you would be branding and marketing it for. Intermediaries, you know, end consumers, grocery stores, et cetera. There's a variety of different types of consumers that might be purchasing that product. So. I don't know if you have the answer to that, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. No, no, no. Uh, that's something we are thinking through. Uh, first, I think there is a general branding differentiation of the product of, uh, let's say, Arctic char, which is one of the main uh, inshore fish for uh, the Arctic, uh, which uh, still hasn't, I think, uh, made its uh, unique characteristics uh, visible on the market with, with mixed up with farmed Arctic char and other sorts of Arctic char. So there's a collective, I think, uh, idea to, to uh, raise that value up for unique um, wild Arctic char from specific rivers. It, it's uh, uh, together with uh, some of the uh, intermediaries, uh, this is being worked on uh, out with, like River Select, for example, is very interesting in uh, creating these unique, distinct brands and to tell a story for different flesh colors, different areas, different families that have uh, have uh, done that. I think you have to have partners in the South that have um, a connection to the um, auctions and buyers. Uh, directly and that uh, pilot this uh, on a small scale to get this distinct taste and interest in the product first. Yeah, that's interesting. So is it like the Copper River model that you're thinking of that's, for, that's been done for salmon where it's a particular river, it's wild caught and certain other qualities are emphasized? Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and and I think that's the that's one of the possible mo models. Um, uh, Lake to Plate is already doing a, a something that's a bit similar, where it's directly to restaurants also or to intermediaries like Skipper Auto, and uh, there's they have to go. There's still a long way to go in making sure that um, the products are all differentiated more. We do have also genetic uh, information that can clearly distinguish populations, subpopulations, which would also ensure more maybe consumers on the sustainability side, uh, so which could add a, additional value, additional labels on, onto it. Thank you. Hey, good. Hi. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm wearing a mask. Uh, I have a quick question. How did you get access to the financial information? So you can um, financials from processors, I think. Yeah, the, the, those financial uh, uh, information was is directly available uh, uh, on online uh, on the internet. You can uh, have access to that. Um, it, it's because it's uh, really owned by uh, the government of Nunavut. Uh, they have to publicly um, present that. It's Nunavut Development Corp that is investing into fish plants. Once a bit of a fish, uh, consistent fish market is developed locally, that fishers are bringing uh, things to 
um, for some processing to the HTO or local establishment, then there is an investment opportunity for these fish plants. The question now, none of it is, should they invest in more fish plants or more small cut and wrap facilities, smaller processing facilities, and then process them more in the south, bring them more directly to intermediaries because of this loss effect and also the, uh, the, the, the inefficient scale of production. So that's a bit of a, a discussion right now. But those local jobs are very um, liked. People like to work on the plants. They seem to, um, so that's that's a bit of a trade-off if you don't process there. Uh, but it's also logistically sometimes difficult to bring it to local uh, processing plants to get them there. Um, from the two communities I'm working with, they are far away from either of those. And, and so then they, they have to ship it by, by airplane there's no, there are no roads, there, there are no ships, so uh, only, you know, so you can, ha you have to rely on air, airplane shipping. Thank you. So, the last question is somebody has, because we have to. Sorry? No, uh, I just asked if there is more questions. Okay. And uh, I don't see any hands. So, thank you very much, Stefan. Yeah, thanks for your questions. If you have any other comments, ideas, we're always very interested in working on all kinds of new creative models. Okay, thank you. So, the next speaker is Anthony Charles. Anthony Garcia is the only I you know from the group. He's an economist and professor at the University of St. Mary, Halifax. So, Anthony, you can go. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, it's a, a pleasure to see some of you uh, gathered in St. John's and others uh, online. Uh, this um, is a talk that is uh, a little bit different from the previous one, uh, as these um, contributed paper sessions tend to be. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be looking kind of broadly at uh, at research and knowledge building in small scale fisheries in Canada. Uh, now this um, this is actually uh, the first presentation of a chapter in a new book that Evan Andrews and Christine Knott are preparing. Um, so I get paid extra for plugging the book. Uh, it, they'll be very pleased with this. Uh, I can repeat it a few more times that there is a book coming out on small scale fisheries in Canada. Um, my particular contribution is a little bit unusual in the sense that uh, I, I'm looking back a, a little bit more than uh, 30 years to uh, an opportunity I had at a very interesting um, international conference in France uh, that was all about uh, research and knowledge creation in small scale fisheries on a, on a global uh, basis and looking at multiple regions. I was in, in particular asked to uh, talk about North America, which is uh, is obviously a fairly substantial uh, task. And uh, so that resulted in an article uh, looking at, uh, particularly at research perspectives uh, in North America. Uh, and so what I'm going to do today is, is basically look at what the situation was 30 years ago and what it is today in terms of uh, knowledge building in Canadian small scale fisheries. Uh, you'll see uh, occasionally some quotes. I'm actually quoting myself from 30 years ago and um, uh, wanting to see how things have changed, uh, if they have done. Um, so 30 years ago, um, I suggested that use of the term small-scale fishery was almost absent from fisheries discussions in North America. Uh, that's in terms of the kind of official um, governmental discussions. Uh, and, and I, I would maintain that that was an accurate assessment at the time. Uh, interestingly, it, um, it, it seems to be not uh, too much changed even now. Um, during the negotiations for the FAO's, uh, United Nations Small Scale Fisheries Guidelines, Canada was uh, famously um, uh, kind of uh, not really in the camp of, uh, of understanding the, the reality of small scale fisheries in Canada. Um, and it's a bit of an open question as to uh, where that is today. 
so so that that very aspect of the the, the understanding of what small scale fisheries is uh, is is still um, uh, contested, I would say. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to run through a few specific uh, themes that have I, I think are uh, important and have something to be said about comparing uh, then and now. So basically, again, each of these is looking at a 30 year period. One in particular, fishery objectives. Um, back 30 years ago, uh, it seemed striking that there was uh, very rarely asked the question of what are the fishery objectives, even in academic research where you might think that that would be more common. This has changed a lot in the last 30 years, uh, at least at my assessment, uh, and, and there's been a, a lot of work on the East Coast in particular, looking at um, what are the objectives, what are the goals in, uh, in Canada's small-scale fisheries. Uh, from a fishery systems point of view, uh, a, a pet theme of mine and management systems as well. Um, 30 years ago, the, um, the, the idea of looking at the uh, fishery bureaucracy or the fishery management system um, is fitting into a dynamic system alongside the fish, fishing fleet, fishers, and fishing communities. That um, remains a, a key point today. Uh, Co-management, you know, back 30 years ago was uh, just being talked about uh, more and more um, by uh, key uh, contributors like uh, Lynn Pinkerton. And, um, and now uh, co-management, uh, this, is, this is perhaps one of those cases where it has become uh, really at the center of, uh, of attention. Looking at, um, the, uh, and just for the sake of of time, I'm, I'm lumping together post-harvest labor issues and the role of women in fisheries. Um, 30 years ago, this, uh, these were all relatively little discussed. Some of them have grown in, in specific ways. Um, the value chain and the food systems approach um, on the post-harvest side, uh, uh, feminist fishery uh, research being uh, more prominent than it was, but still understudied. And uh, from a labor point of view, uh, some contributions back then and um, continuing uh, at, at a modest level today. Uh, now, uh, following on from the previous talk, uh, you know, 30 years ago, there was certainly discussion of specific indigenous fisheries uh, in the Arctic and uh, salmon fisheries in BC was a, was a common topic. Some might remember the, um, uh, the Pierce Commission from the West Coast that uh, was back um, uh, long ago in the uh, 80s. But I think this is one area where, uh, where attention has, has grown uh, really greatly. And, um, and it's not only in research, which is my theme today, but also, of course, in uh, policy discussions. One area that um, all, has also grown, I think, uh, considerably is the whole uh, connection of fisheries and biodiversity conservation. I'm actually uh, involved with a, with a UN FAO project right now looking at the stewardship activities in small scale fisheries on an international basis, but that's, um, that's now a much bigger topic in the Canadian setting as well, including uh, dealing with issues of uh, impacts of marine protected areas. Um, and, and finally, in terms of some key issues, uh, one that was not on the radar much 30 years ago is the whole link that's uh, a big deal now in small scale fisheries internationally of uh, the link of human rights and fishing rights um, for indigenous communities certainly, but, uh, but more broadly, the uh, human rights based approach uh, internationally has become a major theme. Now, I, I want to say uh, some quick words about uh, topics uh, in terms of knowledge building. Uh, one is that the idea of disciplines and multidisciplinarity uh, and transdisciplinarity. Um, it, it's, it was not um, a topic uh, that was big uh, 30 years ago, I would say, but the, the conference that I was uh, referring to in France was um, a interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary one. Um, but surely, uh, and you know, TBTI is a uh, center of this as well. 
uh, surely the, um, the the growing discussion of transdisciplinarity is a is a major step forward. The participatory approach, you know, uh, uh, back before the, um, the cod fishery collapse on the east coast of Canada, um, participatory approaches were not a big deal. Um, that again is one that's changed a fair bit, but uh, a recent paper I did with uh, Melina Pooley uh, in fisheries uh, looks at some uh, serious limitations of that. And finally, the whole idea of knowledge inclusion, uh, as, as was mentioned just in the previous talk, uh, the indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, um, not well discussed uh, 30 years ago, uh, much more so today, but, um, but there's regular calls for more um, because there, there is still uh, issues around the both technical aspects of linking fishery science and, uh, and traditional knowledge, but also moral uh, issues around uh, control of the knowledge. Uh, so to, to sum up, um, I think that it's fair to say that some of the gaps that were um, identified uh, 30 years ago have been at least partially uh, filled. Um, there's been studies in new, newer areas that have really uh, taken off, uh, but there's um, a lot of gaps still there. Uh, still a need for advocacy on the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary side of knowledge building. And, um, and basically looking back at history, um, as, as I've tried to do in this, uh, in this talk, in this chapter in the new book, um, is, is a way uh, to build the, the knowledge building agenda for the future. Um, there is a need to keep overcoming barriers. Um, by, by tackling the, the needs that are still there and moving into the future. And, and, and I think that that's if especially crucial given three big drivers that we're facing. Changes in legislation affecting the objectives and the policy options, the blue economy issue and the whole um, connection of uh, blue justice as, a, as an approach to come up with a decent blue economy uh, uh, advances. And then the third being the marine and biodiversity conservation side, the post IT targets are coming along. And uh, that's really going to have an effect on uh, the seascape for fisheries in Canada and small scale fisheries in particular. Uh, so I'll leave it there and uh, welcome any questions or any uh, comments, feedback uh, in the session or um, afterwards. Thanks very much. Good, uh, Tony. Good, good. Uh, some questions to Tony because uh, he make uh, all this picture of the Canadian uh, fisheries. Me, I don't know so much about that. So, any question? Any thoughts? Yes. Yes, I meant to say the the uh, the photos were from. Uh, all three coasts, but mostly the east coast of Canada. Uh, hey, Tony, thanks for your talk. This is Josh Stoll, e Um Hi there. I have a sort of a question about your one of your last bullets in your conclusion about the blue economy being a threat. Um, I, I sort of sh generally share that perspective, but I'm wondering if you see it solely as a threat, or is the, is there an opportunity? Um, for small scale fisheries to use it to their advantage? Well, you know, I, I, as I'm sure you, you have seen, uh, it, it depends on where, uh, where we're looking. Um, it, it, I, I've seen a lot of um, presentations on the blue economy that are um, basically um, synonymous with uh, blue growth, however you can, uh, however you can find it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess I, my sense is that one of the greatest advances, advances we've seen internationally has been the uh, small scale fisheries guidelines. Um, I, I, it, not just because they, they promote small scale fisheries, but because they give a really integrated, balanced way to look at holistically at uh, fisheries generally. I mean, they apply really just as 
much to large scale fisheries as to small scale, I would argue. Um, so I guess my concern in a, in a big picture sense is that um, a push to the blue economy um, marginalizes uh, what, what should be a real focus on, on the small scale fishery guidelines, implementing them in Canada and elsewhere. Um, but you know, on the other hand, uh, I think it is possible, to, uh, and and you know, you see a lot of, of countries, poorer countries like Madagascar has a blue economy strategy. Um, they, if it's seen properly as uh, as a way to uh, to actually support their long-standing sectors like small-scale fisheries, you know, I guess hypothetically it could it could be effective. Um, I just worry that it's not often looked at that way. Questions? I think that economy can be an opportunity, but it can be a threat too. Uh, it depending how the how we know that the politicians, at least in Europe, they see blue economy as uh, new activities with a lot of money and big capital and so on. But in the other hand, I think it's uh, also our duty and science, as scientists to bring the small-scale fisheries in the front uh, of the, this political debate concerning the, okay, it's, uh, it's not uh, easy to win, but uh, let's try. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're right there. And, in, in, you know, a, a related topic is marine spatial planning. Uh, which, which is, of course, a major um, force in, um, well, in many countries, in Europe, for sure, and, uh, and to some extent in Canada and uh, the U.S. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different beast from, um, from the blue economy discussions, uh, but they, the two have a lot in common in the sense that uh, they, both, they both can impact on traditional ocean uses as um, as they're trying to make room for new ocean uses. So, uh, you know how how that plays out in both of those uh, blue economy and marine spatial planning. Uh, that'll be a key issue for the years ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tony, for this uh, nice presentation. Thank you. So the third speaker is not here, Hilary. Uh, we move to Jean Marty. Jean Marty? Yes, he's here. Hi, Hi everybody. Juan Marty. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Uh... You have 12 minutes. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, will you, oh, yes, yes, no. Uh, well, my name is Juan Carlos Martí. I'm from Costa Rica, and I'm the CEO of a traceability startup uh, working with small scale fisheries. Uh, we've been through several uh, instances around the world working with technology in fisheries with Catapult Ocean in Norway, Schmidt Marine in California, and CDL uh, there in, in home base Halifax. And, and we're trying to, to use technology to help fisheries become more sustainable. Uh, sadly, in the last five years, working with this segment, uh, we see that challenges are, are speeding at a pace that it's a little bit faster than sometimes the solutions that we are trying to bring, bring to the table. Uh, and this has led us thinking how we can scale impact uh, in a way that it's faster and, and, and hopefully uh, look for ways that work in some context but are replicable in others around the world. And I'm gonna tell you a story uh, around these three guys. Uh, to the left, the two brothers, Richard McDonald 
and Maurice McDonald. And probably you already know uh, of what I'm talking about, that it's the, the creators of, of McDonald's in 1950 with a unique uh, system that they created. They, they were unique, there, there was only one store, but they created this process that was completely different. Uh, they call it the speedy service system. And in the movie, uh, the founder uh, that represents all this uh, model, uh, they de depict this idea around the courtyard in, in how they were trying to make the whole system even faster. Uh, the whole concept uh, was to, to aim for speed, low prices and volume. And even though there were many drive-ins at that moment, they were actually doing something completely different. And of course, the other side of the story is when this person appears in, in, in the picture and he sees a completely different model from everything that he has seen around the drive-ins in, in that moment. And he takes that idea of the speedy uh, it processes and transforms this to a franchise model aiming for scale scalability. Well, today, uh, obviously, it's a, it's a brand known around the world with 40,000 restaurants in 2021, over three, $23 billion in annual revenue. And the interesting things about uh, social franchising or franchising is that it represents around 10.5 of all businesses in the US, almost 19 million jobs globally, and 1.7 trillion in revenue around the world. So actually this is one of the most successful business models. And the idea uh, why this is so successful is that it's not reinventing the wheel uh, over and over. It's about scaling ideas that already have a proven uh, that they work. And through systematization processes, training, ongoing support, they scale these uh, models. Obviously, the brand is part of the whole success of a of a um, franchise trying to get market recognition. So it's not only the processes, but also having a face to the consumers. And the whole system is dynamic. It's always evolving and learning, not just from the franchise or to the franchisees, but actually the franchisees providing feedback to the whole system. And in terms of, of gaining more political capital, in a bigger voice in, as, a, as a business. It's really interesting that in the last years, there's a new uh, movement uh, taking this relatively old business model and applying the same commercial franchising methods and concepts, but to achieve social benefits. So this is the new uh, version of franchising that it's called a social franchising. And this being uh, an interesting model that it's growing, especially in developing countries around the world, around healthcare, insurance, housing, agriculture, agriculture with really interesting examples on how to get uh, agricultural supplies, uh, maybe at a lower cost for a bigger segment. And Till this day, uh, we haven't found anything around fisheries. And that, that's the whole idea of bringing this topic uh, today to spark some discussions around how we might use social franchising in the small scale fisheries sector. Uh, I think uh, some of the presenters mentioned uh, that there is a growing market uh, and an opportunity of 
traceable, eco-friendly seafood, uh, trying to get more fair trade consumption uh, to the table. <coughs> Sadly, uh, still small scale fisheries is a little bit far from these models. Although we see initiatives all over the world trying to connect fishermen and consumers in a more transparent, fair, and sustainable model. Uh, the sea to plate, fish to dish, hook to cook, and the, the one that I learned today, lake to plate, uh, they're all initiatives and, and concepts trying to make a more fair and hopefully sustainable uh, models. And the idea is how we can learn from McDonald's and bring these social franchises for small scale fisheries, reframing these sea to plate initiatives, thinking about this model and aiming to design a scalable scheme and using a brand as a powerful element uh, to have a face that is more recognizable towards the consumers. This is uh, an example that we are trying to build here in Costa Rica, trying to build a social franchise for small scale fisheries in three uh, tiers. The parent franchiser, uh, the one that it's developing technology, brand recognition, trying to get the, the brand out there through marketing. A local tier that it's more around the fish processing infrastructure, trying to get the inputs to the fishermen in, at a lower cost, technical support, and hopefully the legality compliance. And finally, the franchisees that we see them as fishing cooperatives, uh, providing the, the catch, the fish, the data, and a fee for the whole model to, to continue. And all this using technology to, as a transversal to understand every part of the value chain and trying to understand what's happening around the model. This pilot, it's around getting the small scale fisheries and transforming these products uh, for the high end market. Uh, trying to get some values of sustainable catch um, for fair trade and quality into the, into the model. What we are going to do is aim for partner with selected small scale fisheries cooperatives, invest and improve the infrastructure, arrange logistics and commercialize under a brand. Obviously this is not new, but the idea is to have all these process thought from the get go on a social franchise model. So trying to get all the processes and all the blueprints uh, to hopefully get uh, a business in a box uh, concept. And the technologies that we will be using are low cost uh, boat tracking, uh, trying to get image and data loggers to understand the catch composition and identifications uh, to, to have the data being traceable uh, to the source. And all this in a management platform to have eyes in the model, communication with the franchisees, and run the, the sustainability, uh, maximum sustainability yield on, on the behavior that we will be seeing in the small scale uh, fisheries that we will be working with. Obviously, this is just one example but there could be other uh, social franchises models within this sector. For example, one that it's uh, regarding providing bait or, or ice at a lower cost for the fishermen or eventually microfinancing uh, for this segment. What, what we are presenting, it's an idea that we will try to bring to to concept and systematization on the next year. Uh, but hopefully not think about this as just a, um, a frozen model, 
but a living system that is always evolving. So the franchisor and the franchisees are always sharing knowledge uh, between, between the whole uh, model. And just to end with the, with the uh, McDonald's example, that the creator of the Happy Meal was one of the franchisees in Guatemala. Uh, so what we dream is for this model to have the interconnection of the small scale fisheries so we can build something that is replicable and scalable as fast as the challenges that we are seeing around the small scale fisheries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. So some questions to this uh, new model. I see one hand there. Hi, thank you, Juan, for your presentation. Um, I have a question. So I didn't understand if the franchise um, system or is already in place, and if so, or if it will be in place, what is the decision-making process for fish harvesters in small-scale fisheries in Costa Rica? Uh, how does it work, or who works in small-scale small-scale fisheries in Costa Rica, and how they would be involved in the franchise? So the idea is to, to implement this model in the next year. So it's not actually on place. And, and we will be working with uh, fishing cooperatives uh, on, uh, on a first phase. Just uh, as a model, it will not be, uh, as you know, uh, a model that, that it's a one size fits all, uh, probably there's some characteristics that will enable uh, for the model to work with a specific fishing cooperative. Uh, so all these are part of the, the unknowns that, that we will be trying to uh, discover in the next year. Oh, I see many hands now. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, hi, I'm Sina Evan from uh, University of Connecticut, Connecticut Sea Grant. I was just curious, um, so we have the Marine Stewardship Council and their certification, and this seems like a kind of a small scale kind of uh, idea that kind of parallels a little bit of what they do. And I was just wondering if you, you know, if you engage with them or have thought of, of their, I know they cost a lot of money and it's very data driven. So how, how does your this idea of social franchising differ from that very top-down model that you know Unilever and whatever has created with? Thanks for the question. Actually, yes, we've been uh, analyzing the risk-based assessment of Marine Stewardship Council and how uh, this model could eventually uh, align with some of the the data that they need to collect. Uh, if we use low cost traceability solutions within the model, we could eventually lower the assessment costs uh, and hopefully get uh, certifications uh, on their uh, manageable uh, uh, price point. Uh, so this is definitely something that, that we are studying uh, from the data collection point of view. And, and eventually when we collect this data, see, how we can align to the risk-based assessment. Um, my question is similar to Maria's question in that um, I was wondering uh, what kind of story you're going to tell and what kind of knowledge is going to be exchanged between the harvesters and the franchisees. Uh, and then, um, so it's sort of along the lines of the decision making. And then also I'm curious whether you've uh, spoken to anybody from this fish, uh, which was created by EcoTrust in British Columbia, because it does sound, it sounds very similar in the sense that they have that traceability aspect and they are interested in telling a story. So each time you um, enter that number into the system uh, on the computer, a photo pops up, it tells a neat little story about your harvester, where it was harvested, how that type of information. Shot us. We want mm -hmm. longer. Question. Juan, just a little shot us. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, no, uh, we haven't talked to, to this fish. Uh, it would be great to, 
to to get a contact uh, because I think that they are doing from the traceability point of view uh, some elements uh, that could be uh, uh, valuable within the model. It would be traceability just as one element of of the whole design of the so social franchise model. So thank you very much, Juan. Thank you. Oh, now it's uh, Maria Andrea Lopez Gomez, and I hope she's here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> everybody wants to like, get up. Because after, <laughs> after three presentations, all right, um, how can I change this slide? So, so my presentation is about recruitment, training, and retention in small scale fish racing in Finland and Labrador. So, in this province, in the province where we are at. And this is part of the Ocean Frontier Institute model informing governance responses for changing ocean. And the team members of this study are Nicole Power, who's here. <laughs> She's the lead of the model. Barbara Nice, Paul Foley, John Peter Johnson, and Sina Sovinson, who are uh, John Peter and Sina are in uh, Norway. I'm sorry. <laughs> So um, as many of you heard today, um, small scale fisheries play a vital role in communities in Eastern Canada, especially here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, they generate employment, they anchor wealth to rural and coastal communities in the province, and um, it's a way of life. Fisheries have uh, historically, uh, you enter the fishery through a socialization process, so your family, your friends, <coughs> you learn to fish as a child. We've heard from fish harvesters themselves today in the plenary sessions. Um, so that's the context in Newfoundland and Labrador. Next, please. So um, we've also heard about the different moratoria and specifically the ground fish collapse and social and ecological changes and how that um, just pushed a change in policies and regulations. And it involved um, in Newfoundland and Labrador the exit of 40,000 workers um, in the 90s, fish harvesters and processing workers. The decline continued. We can see in this graph, uh, this is the number of registered fish harvesters in the Professional uh, Fish Harvester Certification Board in the province. This is what Rick Williams was talking about, the apprenticeship um, certification board. Um, so this is data that they provided. So you can see that the number of fish harvesters is declining from 2000 to 2017 after um, the ground fish collapse. Um, the effects continue and also the workforce is aging. The groups uh, of fish harvesters between 25 and 34 and 35 and 44 and so on, the number of fish harvesters in, the, in these age groups are decreasing while the number of fish harvesters above 54 are increasing. Um, so Rick Williams, actually this study was led by Rick Williams. It's a labor market study of fish harvesters. And uh, they conducted two labor market studies, one in 2004 and one in 2015. They found that across Canada, not only in Finland and Labrador, uh, they found that uh, the number of fish harvesters in this province is decreasing, uh, decreased by 48% from 2000 to 2015. So similar figures from the previous graph. Uh, but in other provinces, it, or the decrease was uh, minor, but was uh, lower, but still significant. Um, in this study, um, uh, they conducted a survey, a telephone survey with fish harvesters, both crew members and captains, and they asked them, uh, are you having trouble, um, difficulties recruiting crew members to your vessel? And we can see that in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, about 47% had some difficulties recruiting groups. So this uh, points out to the looming labor shortages in the province. So reasons why they had troubles recruiting the crew were that people wanted more weeks of work, more stable employment and income. Fewer people were interested in the fishery and more people were retiring. We also spoke or gave a presentation along with the director of the certification board of the province and he also mentioned that there's a stable number of crew members entering each year into the fishery, but they're not staying. So about 20% stay, but most of them leave. Um, next. 
So this study, um, meant, uh, the purpose of this study is to under, understand underlying processes and dynamics, including policies that relate to recruitment, training, and retention, and also to identify potential policies or efforts that could improve um, intergenerational recruitment in the longer term. So specific objectives were just to identify trends in these three areas, document experiences of fish harvesters and people who, wanted, who want to enter fisheries work, and to map changes in, in policies, regulations, and professionalization in the past three decades. So there's been some previous research in the North Atlantic Ocean, not only uh, here in Canada, but also in the UK, um, in Norway. And um, John Peter Johnson at the Soviet Union have done a lot of recruitment uh, research in Norway, and they found that there's push uh, factors and pull factors. So factors that push fish harvesters out of the fishery and factors that pull fish harvesters out of the fishing. So the push factors are those consistent of the infrastructure of fishing. So the regulations, um, the professionalization system, they, that income is unpredictable, um, that there's high interest costs to maintain the vessel and to enter and uh, buy licenses. And the pull factors have to do with social issues that not necessarily are directly related to the fishery such as uh, people wanting more education or going to college for a different education, having other job opportunities close to coastal regions, having higher wages in other jobs and improved working conditions, as well as different welfare states that allow people to change jobs and also uh, have unemployment benefits in between. Next. So we conducted a mixed methods uh, research study that consisted of first an online survey to fish harvesters in the province. Um, we targeted people who were registered fish harvesters through the certification board. Then we conducted a literature uh, review and data collection for fisheries related organizations such as DFO and certification board. And we were able to conduct interviews during the pandemic by phone or by Zoom. Uh, with different people interested in uh, working in the fishery. And this is all focused in the province. And I just want to highlight that. <laughs> um, so just for the survey results, we had um, 330 people answering the survey, which I think it's pretty good. Um, Rick Williams, in their study for the labor market study, they had about uh, 400 people answering their phone survey. This was an online survey. We had half, half of the respondents were owner, owner operators and half crew members. The average age of the, of the participants was 48, which is a bit lower than the average age of participants in Rick's uh, study, maybe because of the online component. Um, crew members are younger than uh, owner operators. Most of them have been fishing for a long time, more than a decade. And there was very low participation of younger fishers, but also of women. I forgot to write that. <laughs> Even though there's uh, the number of fish harvesters in the province that are women, it's about 20%. Um, so we discovered in the survey results that most people enter the fishery or the, that could work in the fishery are from the region. Uh, people recruit. Uh, within the family, by word of mouth, uh, from the community. So that indicates that the socialization process it hasn't changed much in that aspect. Um, if crew is needed, well, first of all, uh, owner operators have worked with the same crew for several years, for decades, so crew tend to be older as well. And when there's need to, to have a crew, they know who to hire already. They, they have family members or word of mouth, they know who, which crew would be available. And this happens not because uh, owner operators have different licenses for different species. And sometimes for some species, they need more crew than for other species. So they need extra help. Mm -hmm. We ask, uh, we asked um, owner operators if they had difficulties finding crew and only 21% said that they had some difficulties, which is lower than what Rick found in his study. And this happened, um, these this were the perceptions from 2019, even though the survey uh, was conducted in 2020. We also asked crew members if they had trouble finding a job. 
And as you can see, uh, only 40% had some trouble finding a job. So it's not an immediate uh, recruitment uh, problem, but as we've heard in other plenary sessions, it's more intergenerational and intergenerations. Um, so we did find, well, in our survey, there was low representation of women and youth. Um, there were, and um, we asked uh, fish harvesters if they had children and they did, uh, if they encouraged their children to fish for a living, 57 said they didn't, 57% said that they didn't. We also found that uh, there's very few fish harvesters climbing up the professionalization ladder. So Rick Williams mentioned this in the plenary session that if this is the only province where there's an apprenticeship system. So you go from apprentice to level one to level two with different conditions. Um, you can go to level one after two years of full-time fishing and level uh, two after three additional um, years of full-time fishing. Full-time fishing means uh, earning 75% of your income from fishing during the fishing season, which usually goes from May to October. Um, and there's also some land-based credits uh, requirements to move up the ladder. In, in the graph, you can see the number of fish harvesters in each level. You can see there's a lot of apprentices, and there's a lot of apprentices who are actually uh, above 54 years of age. So it's typical that people move in the in, <laughs> that people move in the in the apprenticeship uh, ladder. You can see that uh, the average number of years fishing for a living is 15 years for apprentice. So they, there's no motivation to move to level one or level two. Next, please. Um, so here I'm going to go through this very quickly. Entering fisheries work, as um, I mentioned before, it was built through socialization, um, partner fish, and that is how we joined the fishery. Uh, some facilitators that fish harvesters pinpointed was that before DFO had part-time licenses, and then you could become a full-time fisher through part-time licenses. There was a fisheries loan board that helped uh, fish harvesters uh, finance their vessel and license. And training was only hands-on. You didn't need extra credit. And there was the body of arrangement where two fish harvesters with the same license for the same species can fish from the same vessel. So that lowers the cost of the people who are already in the fishery. Some obstacles, not having family with a fishing license, um, uncertainty um, in wages, in weather, regulations. Women found little support to enter the fishery. Um, the requirement for full-time full fishing, um, going up the ladder of professionalization was one of the main complaints, I would say. And uh, not being able to afford food. Some, some uh, owner operators uh, said that, hey, I wish I could have crew during the whole fishing season, but I don't have enough to hire someone. Next, please. Uh, so these are the push and pull factors that we found in Nana Labrador. Um, I've gone through most of them. So the pull factors are that job, there's job opportunities elsewhere that provide stable employment and better wages. There's, um, in the province, uh, people are encouraged to leave the fishery or to do something else and not stay in the fishery. This might be the impact from the 90s and mm -hmm. all the fisheries in Moratoria. Next, please. Um, this is a quote from a fish harvester, which I thought summarized pretty well. Uh, they, the fish harvesters willing to retire, uh, basically are selling their enterprises to existing fishermen who are doubling up or tripling up their quotas. So what I see is the wealth of the sea being concentrated in a relatively fewer and fewer and fewer hands, and the community is dying. I'm not talking about bringing new enterprises in or about expanding the catch capabilities or anything like that, but I'm just talking, sharing what there is among many, as many people as can make a reasonable living from the sea, rather than <coughs> one person having two or three boats and all kinds of quotas. Share the wealth of the sea and try to keep people's fishing villages alive, right? Um, so, um, we also found that the few factors that attracted people to the fishery are that there's a, it's better pay than minimum wage in uh, coastal and rural communities in Finland, working outdoors, the love for the sea, the love for the animals, to be your own boss and to stay in the, in the fishery. 
um, what these are the factors that people need to attract people to the fishery. And I think I don't have any more time. Because I'm going to. We could, yeah. Uh, so there are, uh, there's a looming crisis of intergenerational uh, succession in the fishery. It's been well talked about. There's problems uh, going from crew to owner operator. Owner operators, their enterprises are very viable, they're very protected, such as with policies like the body up. Uh, combining licenses and turning them into one, but for crew, there's no supports to go up mm. the ladder. Um, we found little to no efforts to recruit new entrants into the fishery, no policies that target specifically recruitment. Um, and we also found that recruitment and retention is related to sustainable communities. That we've also heard that in other, in other talks. And there's many. Um, questions that policies need to tackle. Uh, who will keep the licenses? Who will be able to afford them? And what are the plans to improve their future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioned that about half of the respondents were crew. And coming from the US context, where I know it can be really hard to kind of reach and get information on crew, were, you, were those all people that were part of the kind of apprenticeship or is there other, how is that data on crew kind of captured? Yes, so uh, the Professional Fish Harvester Certification Board um, has to certify all fish harvesters who go out fishing. And that's how we recruit people for the survey. We, mm -hmm. through them, we sent an email. They sent an email to everybody who was registered. And that's how people click on the online survey. So that's, that's a very unique uh, mm -hmm. thing about this province. That everybody has to be registered. It's even apprentices that are one there. You're right, though. It's really difficult yeah. to get to access crew. <laughs> it's it's hard to find out who they are. Right there. Yeah. 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 For the interviews, it was very very difficult to find crew. Well, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the, we have another okay. presentation, but uh, I'll it's unfair for the people question. they are here because the other they took uh, ages. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay. Well, sorry. Is it, I mean, if you want to go, you can go. Uh, go so, ahead. Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, the questions about the uh, the women's participation in the fishery. I think in your sample you had something like five percent, so seven out of one hundred fifty-two or whatever, something like that. And then I think you said twenty percent are actually owner operators. So oh, no, no, uh, no. Uh, so registered. Uh, uh, so they could be in any of those. Yes, actually, only four percent of owner operators are women. Uh, okay, so that answers my question. I'm yeah. wondering why that apparent gap was there, but it's not. Yeah, answered. yeah. One thing is the survey data or our yeah. sample, and the other thing is the whole sample. And yeah, only four percent of women, but only four percent of owner operators are women. Okay, so your survey is actually pretty close. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there was well, there was higher participation. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Me, I have a lot of questions, but I will uh, ask you. <laughs> <laughs> the last speaker, sorry. I, I think the other sessions they are delayed too. Because all these things and. No, it's um, just try to. Present what is the aim of my research? A little bit of it, uh, findings, and this is not my. Oh, this is what you said. No, 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 this is the last one. Thank you. Sorry. Take a start. My name is Will, and uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Waterloo under the School of Environment, Enterprise, and Development, and I'm working with Patrick Meyer. Uh, today, uh, my talk is about the vulnerability to biotech transition and uh, whether the existing governing theories and approaches uh, can help or facilitate this transition happen for small scale fisheries. So, yeah. <clears throat> next so the total outline of my presentation, I'm not over this one. <laughs> next one, please. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, yeah, so this is the this is the first part of my PhD research study, and uh, in this uh, in this one I was looking at whether the theories are uh, well equipped to deal with the 
uh, vulnerabilities of small scale fisheries and make them viable, and uh, whether they can address all the vulnerabilities. So, based on the secondary surveys, okay. I was interested to look into this area because uh, there has been a lot of changes in terms of management and governance stuff. Uh, there, there are a lot of theories and approaches already there. So uh, I just looked over them and reviewed them whether they can deal with the vulnerabilities of, of, of small scale fisheries. Uh, so my the aim of my research, so if go next please. The aim of my research was to look at the governability of the existing governing, governance approaches and see whether they are well equipped to deal with the vulnerabilities of small scale fisheries. Uh, in most cases, we have seen that the issues are related to governance, especially small scale fisheries and the vulnerabilities. Yeah, so these are the uh, theories uh, and approaches that I have analyzed. So you can see there are some limitations of it, how much I could be to the projects, etc. I haven't found anything from the data governance, but I have to dig, dig further into this uh, approach. Uh, so, based on that, if you look at the electric governance theory, it has some limitation in terms of like whether we can uh, have uh, whether we can whether we can look at the uh, whether predict uncertainties and take action beforehand, or it's just about uh, applying this theory and approach to get recovered from the losses that we have to, we already have from many uncertainties. And similarly, if you look at the policy the governance. The role of different governing institutions uh, and the representative from small scale fisheries in particular, how they want to represent their uh, themselves uh, in decision making, which is not explicit in many cases. And the main uh, drawback that I have found about environmental governance is intergenerational equity. If we are very effective in terms of resource exploitation, it can create the um, uh, issue about the intergenerational equity for future. And who has been the main drawback of this theory is that uh, it was I found it is unable to capture the complexity, diversity, um, uh, dynamic issues, and the scale issues of uh, small scale fisheries. And also, it has been uh, there were few details that suggested that it was failed to um, reduce the poverty for small scale fisheries. Yeah, so these are the vulnerabilities of small scale fisheries. This, uh, this is a uh, this. Uh, I have taken from the recent publication from the Islam and Joint Bank. They have done really good work in terms of uh, they identify the vulnerabilities and uh, make them uh, under five main categories. So, if you look at the governance staff, the main factors that are responsible for other vulnerabilities related to governance are um, weak governance or lack of capacity. With monitoring and control and surveillance, inadequate stakeholders participation, unfair rules and regulation, uh, inappropriate institution, poor fishers uh, organizations. Next one, please. Okay, so how the existing governance uh, theory that I have analyzed, how they are dealing with these vulnerabilities? There are often overlap among the theories in, uh, in terms of their practice and implementation. It also suggests that some theories just explain particular vulnerability situation, while others can be applied to solving the problem. For example, the integrated governance theory can be applied to analyze the, the vulnerabilities related to uh, social, economic, technological, and governance aspects. On the other hand, adaptive governance, human is meant, polycentric governance can be adopted as each a governing uh, approach to deal with the certain vulnerabilities. So the polycentricity of the governing system allows to resolve conflicts, uh, as well as enhance the capacity of both the stakeholders and governing system through a multi-level decision making. So the lessons learned from this uh, analysis uh, is that one of the main problems is that not a single governance approach or theory can explain or govern each of the vulnerabilities of small scale fisheries. They cannot address all the vulnerabilities. So in that case, we have to take uh, uh, we have to. Uh, Certain vulnerabilities are dealing with, we can deal, uh, deal with some uh, one or two uh, governance theories and approaches, but there is no uh, combined theories or approach that we can uh, use in terms of dealing with the vulnerabilities of small scale fisheries. The diversity, complexity, dynamics, and scale issues of small scale fisheries make a governance system less governable. 
The governability of the small scale fisheries largely depends on the moves, orders, and elements of governance that are in practice. The use and application of these modes, orders, and elements of the existing governing system are uh, not context specific in many cases. Okay, that's fine. And uh, so I would recommend some based on the analysis, uh, uh, a few recommendations I made. The first one is before adopting an approach, an analysis of the governing system is required and their strength, uh, capacity, and weaknesses should be identified. And also, uh, the governing system needs to be open. If more actors need to be included in the decision making process, and how they're going to represent themselves in the decision making process. And finally, a governability model in the context of small scale fishery governance is required by combining all the theories, which is, uh, I hope, uh, I'll be working on more. And uh, maybe next year, or mm. year ahead, I can present uh, our uh, combined governability model for small scale fisheries. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. For So uh, in the governance model or the governance series, you, you pointed out to a problem around either generational, can you say a little bit more about that? So for example, polycentric governance, uh, uh, environmental governance, it, there are, uh, uh, it talks about effective utilization of natural resources. So once you have an uh, effective utilization of natural resources, for example, small fish of one particular resource area, if we effectively use it for now, or right. we are using, utilizing That's it, like, so that will be an issue for the future generation. Right? Yes, I understand.